this project started out a couple of years ago, and some of you will have seen some version of these slides before. Um, it was essentially around optimizing a solution for diagnostic metagenomics for respiratory illnesses in general. Um, now that sounds quite prescient. At the time, it was more expedient because we had some samples we were particularly interested in from patients who had either sepsis following respiratory illness or um, meningitis, and they're from two different cohorts. So for this work, um, my partners in crime were Cindy Go, who's an intensive care clinician and at the time was a DPhil student who's just finished. Uh, Azim Ansari, who some of you know, who um, was in the stats and microbial population, was um, doing stats microbial population genetics. He's now at the BDI actually. Uh, and Rory Bowden, who a lot of you will remember, who is now at the Walter and Eliza Hall in uh, Melbourne. So when I talk about diagnostic metagenomics, usually there's a lot of blank faces. Nice thing about doing a presentation on Zoom is that you don't see the blank faces. So I'm just going to pretend they're there. Um, the definition in a dictionary of the word diagnosis actually has two parts to it. The first is the one we all think about which is identifying the nature of an illness or some other problem by working out what the symptoms look like. And the second part is a kind of characterization in the precise terms of genus or species or phenomenon. And between those two things, they really point to pathogen identification in this case. As a kind of aside and leaving aside the method and just thinking about the philosophy of this, if you like. Diagnosis is not pathogen identification. That seems like self-evident, but it's worth thinking about why this is the case. So diagnosis in the clinical sense is thinking about what is making the patient ill. And the way that we make that decision or the way the clinicians make that decision is really based on a kind of pre-existing mental model of what causes the particular symptoms that they're observing in the population that the patient's derived from. So that might be reflected by their age or sex or ethnicity, comorbidities, what have you. Uh, in that particular population or slice of population, what are the known causes of this condition and are any of them likely to be responsible for the illness in the patient? But when we think about pathogen identification, that's actually a different part of this cycle because what we're really doing is we're saying given the known causes of this condition an infectious condition in the population which relevant organisms are present in this sample and in some way discovery of these organisms updates what we believe are the known causes in a particular population and so that's a slightly different cycle um, the reason those two things are separate, diagnosis and pathogen identification, will become sort of more clear as I talk, but it's just something that is important to keep in mind. So when we think about pathogen identification, that's kind of complex. Um, if we have our crack team here, like Dr. House does, everybody might offer a slightly different idea about what might be making the patient ill, and they might have some ideas about pathogens that we could look for. Now, some of those pathogens could be bacterial, we could have parasites, fungi, or it could be viral. Uh, or, you know, maybe there is no, no pathogen at all. Maybe this is just not an infectious disease. The trouble is you often have a very small amount of sample and a small amount of time. In, in this case, particularly in the meningitis study, we had absolutely tiny volumes of CSF fluid from, uh, of, of CSF from infants. And really there's a limit to what you can do with this kind of sample. So the question is, what do we test for? Well, there are lots of options. And unfortunately, with a serious case, we have limited time and a limited sample volume. We could culture, that's gonna take some time. It'll only pick up bacteria. It is exquisitely sensitive, even in this day and age. Um, but unfortunately for the conditions we were interested in, which was particularly childhood meningitis in the UK, um, half of the samples were culture negative or aseptic. And the same is also true of adult sepsis in the UK, they were culture negative. So you could try PCR. You could say, well, maybe there's a virus. Um, the trouble is for PCR, you need very specific primers. You need to have a really good setup. It's faster than culture, 
uh, but it has its own pitfalls. So in, in particular, the primers could actually be too specific to pick up the diverse viruses that you're interested in. Um, and that is obviously true for HIV, for HCV and so on. It's also true for um, the more common um, viruses like enterovirus, for example, which is extremely diverse. And some of the markers that have been developed are just not very good at picking up the virus in clinical samples. The order of testing can introduce bias if we do sequential PCRs and it depletes the sample and it wastes a lot of time. We can design a multiplex PCR with overlapping amplicons, separate amplicons, many amplicons, uh, but these are very hard to develop. They need optimization. They can have variable performance, particularly in different labs, and they can also suffer from amplicon dropouts, which might become serious if you're using this for sequencing. Um, there are lots of other options which um, go all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. We can do serology, cell counts, and all of these things are done. We can look for specific antigens. Uh, we can look for glucose in this CSF and so on. The trouble is that's a lot of testing. Okay, Dr. House says, just sequence it. Stop wasting time. That's great, but what do we look for? Well, everything. Sequencing, aren't you? Not so easy. So sequencing everything, or otherwise known as metagenomics, really comes in two flavors. There's the kind of standard metagenomics, so untargeted, or you can think of it as kind of hay classification. You have a lot of hay, and what you're doing is separating it into different types of hay. That's kind of great if most of the sample is of interest to you. So if what you're looking at is bacterial community composition or relative species abundance, in a sample where the majority of the sample is what you want, that's fantastic. Uh, when the majority of the sample is human cells or something completely irrelevant, looking for everything could take a huge amount of sequencing. And the other way to do metagenomics, which is the way I'm going to talk about, is kind of called targeted metagenomics, um, or you can think of it as needle detection. So you're really looking at a very small fraction of the sample that is of interest and everything else, as far as you're concerned, is background. That's particularly good for low abundance pathogens with small genomes. Um, it's no surprise that that's the way we sequence HIV. And essentially the method I'm describing is very, very similar to the way that we've been sequencing HIV for Pangea and for Popart. Uh, and for beehive. So what do we need here? Well, if we're sequencing a pathogen that we're interested in, we need a panel of likely suspects. Now this comes back to my little philosophy aside about what diagnosis is and what pathogen identification is. Because as soon as you say, I want a panel of likely suspects, people will say, but what about this other pathogen? And what about this other pathogen? Well, I don't know all respiratory pathogens ever. How can I choose? And to that, we would say, well, if you were given this possible list of pathogens, which ones do you think would be associated with the disease? And actually, when a question is phrased that way, it is often much easier to elicit an expert opinion on an answer. Do I think this one is relevant? Do I think that one is relevant? So essentially, that's what we've done. We've done um, a kind of expert elicitation step where we looked at pathogens that could be associated with either uh, respiratory associated sepsis or meningitis in the UK cohorts particularly, and we focused on those. Um, now, that still leaves quite a lot of options, but that actually turns out to be okay because this particular method that we're using can cover an awful lot of suspects. And the reason for that is that we only need to know the sequence of the pathogen of interest to within about 80% uh, similarity of the genome to the target. And that is plenty to go down to a kind of species level for bacteria. It is plenty to go down to um, for most viral pathogens of interest, provided that uh, good coverage is present in the panel. Um, and the other thing to say is that unenriched or metagenomic sequences, so the sequences that are not in the panel and don't bind to anything um, in the set of targets still remain in the metagenomic library. So you can go back and sequence them afterwards 
or you can even see them sometimes in the metagenomic background. And that's really true even of um, some of the HIV sequences, for example, that we've looked at. So it's, we, this information is available and accessible, but you don't have to sequence it and you don't have to see it unless it's of relevance to the um, disease that you're studying. And this, this plot is from an early paper from a few years ago now uh, by David Bonzel with Azim and with Camilla as well, um, presenting the initial use of this method on HCV primarily, um, hepatitis C virus. So to go, to go back to our respiratory pathogens, we have two cohorts. There's GAINS, which is a sepsis in the UK cohort, um, and CHIMES, which is meningitis, taken from a meningitis and encephalitis cohort of children in the UK. So the populations are quite different. We have some knowledge about what's prevalent in this cohort based on the microbiology data. Um, and these data reflect that sort of 60% of the gain samples had unknown um, etiology, well, they had unknown pathogens at least in terms of the lab data. And that was also true for 40% of the CHIMES cohort. For the rest, the primary causes that were identified in the GAINS cohort, excuse me, were uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, some other bacteria, weird and wonderful, um, influenza, not in very many samples, some other viral samples. And that was just about it. In, it was a little bit better defined in the meningitis cohort. Again, we have pneumococcus here, we have human parechovirus and enterovirus coming up as the two major viral pathogens in the UK, reflecting the fact that we've got very good vaccine coverage. And so a lot of the meningitis that does creep through is actually viral. Um, Neisseria meningitis, as, as you'd expect, and just some other slightly more unusual pathogens. Um, it's probably worth noting at this point that none of the pathogens we were interested in were um, either parasites or fungi. And so we decided not to enrich for those. However, both of those would have such large genomes that if we did sequence this, we would be able to see them from metagenomic data. Uh, with that in mind, we designed the probes to cover everything that we could think of that could be relevant to the UK populations, as well as some things that we just thought might be interesting to add in there and to make the probe set a little bit more flexible um, that turned out to be actually quite an interesting thing to do later on. Um, and if I have time, I might refer back to that. But essentially, the probe design boiled down to selecting the sequences, breaking them up into little clusters based on their sequence similarity, taking one representative of each cluster based on similarity and designing probes of 120 bases, tiling them along the sequences and including about 20 kilobases of all the pathogens of interest or up to 20 if the viral whole genomes are smaller. Um, for the herpes viruses, we just took 20 and that was so that we don't have an overabundance of probes for a particular pathogen, making it more, um, well, making it easier to pick up samples from those pathogens and potentially biasing the panel. So we're conscious about doing that. And for the bacteria, for those of you who are interested, we use the ribosomal MLST typing scheme developed by Keith Jolly over in Zoology. And that was published a few years ago in microbiology. And again, we were taking 20 KB for the bacterial species. So the overview of the protocol is we have our samples taken from the patients. Um, we put them through a method that is essentially identical to what we do with HIV at the moment. I won't go through it in great detail, just to say that we um, perform capture. In this case, we're doing capture in both DNA and RNA. So at the time, we were using next era protocol that included um, total nucleic acid. Um, we synthesized the cDNA for the RNA um, as we would normally do with HIV. We um, pull out the relevant sequences using the probes after the samples have been pulled. So we do a capture on an entire pool um, and then we sequence the result. And that gives us some raw sequence data, which now includes potentially data from lots of different pathogens. We exclude human reads because we are not interested in the human part of the samples. Um, 
and also because we don't, for these particular cohorts, we don't have the ethics to look at the human reads. So these are removed entirely. We also know the likely kid contaminants, um, particularly with next era, those were very well um, characterized. And so we were able to just find them and discard them as early as possible in the whole process. We take the nicely cleaned up reads that now should come only from the pathogens, if there are any within the blood or within the uh, CSF. We take the captured sequences, which have been mapped to the probes, and discard sequences that look like they were unenriched. So there's a kind of clean up step here, um, which allows us to remove the background. Once we've removed the background, what we can do is have a look at how good the genomic coverage is for the samples that seem to have pathogens, which pathogens we've got, do we have any co-infections and so on. And we also had a model that we trained on microbiology lab data, so where we had positive and negative samples. And um, that was just used to help us identify the borderline positives. So does it actually work? If we compare what we're doing with Castanet versus standard or untargeted, unenriched metagenomics, there's a roughly sort of a thousand to 10,000 fold enrichment of low copy number samples, and that really becomes relevant. So as an example here, we've just got one uh, pneumococcus sample. We know it's positive from the lab. By pneumococcus, if we do unenriched metagenomics, so this is where we just sequence the whole library, we do an awful lot of sequencing, 10 and a half million reads. That's a lot of sequencing. It's expensive. We come out with 400 pneumococcus reads. That's, you know, it's not dreadful you know there's a positive and there's sort of 30,000 ultramonas reads which is this is a known kit contaminant just to give you an idea of just how low the signal is in comparison taking the same sample and doing enrichment we only need to sequence 300,000 reads it sounds like a lot but actually it's really quite sort of moderate and you could probably do less and you get out of that very small number um, almost a thousand reads are actually pneumococcus and that's enough to characterize it. And we're just representing that the pneumococcus here is the red, the proportion of all bacterial reads. And in comparison to that, we now get virtually no kid contaminant reads. That's also really important because they're not eating up our sequencing and they're not drowning out the signal. And that's because we haven't enriched for alteromonas, but we have enriched for pneumococcus. We compared how Castanet performed compared with several other labs. And the way this was done is we took a viral mixture reference set um, produced by the NIBSC. We had a mixture where some viruses were quantified actually in the mixture and some were not. And all these labs um, took the same mixture and they performed their own um, methodology, whatever they liked, any methodology that they have to detect the viruses in the panel. And where the box is purple, it shows that the lab failed to detect the virus that was in the panel. Um, so some labs had methods that were better than others. Uh, whoever was in lab two and lab 13 are probably patting themselves on the back. Um, Castanet didn't have probes for sapovirus, norovirus, or astrovirus. So we didn't look at those, although we do actually find them in the metagenomic libraries. But we detect everything that we have probes for. So we were very happy with that. And moreover, as some of you who are familiar with the HIV method know, the method is actually quantitative. And this is also true with the Castanet probe. So even though the probes are metagenomic, even though we're pulling out all of these different viruses from the same sample, and this is that mixture now, um, where they have been quantified and where we knew the quantification data, the input viral load matched very, very well to the number of unique reads we were getting out of these samples. And the trajectory of that, the slope of all these lines was virtually identical. Um, the location's a bit different, reflecting possibly different, slightly different affinity of the probes for the different viruses. But what's really important is that relative to each virus, to each pathogen, um, the result is quantitative. So we looked for CMV, EBV, HPV, rotavirus, and RSV. And also we looked at um, pneumococcus where we had syndicated a huge amount of lab work to do the digital droplet PCR on the large number of her uh, pneumococcus samples from the sepsis cohort and found that that was a similar relationship. It wasn't as neat, but it was still very, very good. 
And the limit of detection similarly as for viruses was around about 100 copies per uh, reaction. So what about real clinical samples? First of all, how did we identify the positives? Well, with a glaring high positive like this, it's really obvious. You've got the whole genome, you've basically sequenced the whole genome. There's no doubt that it's enterovirus, that's what's flagging up, and we just call it that. You get a slightly more complicated case. This is a low viral load sample, again, it's enterovirus, um, and you get this kind of blocky structure. And what this represents is the yellow line is the deduplicated reads. So these are unique reads in the sample that map to that position in the genome. The genome's running along this way in the x-axis. And the blue line represents uh, duplicates. So this is, we kind of sequence very hard and you get copies and copies and copies in every cycle, they go up. And that's why you get this kind of city block structure. Um, that's very, um, very diagnostic in the sense of a low viral load positive. So it means that what we've done is we've captured these little bits of the virus from the sample and we've just enriched for them. Here is a more straightforward negative case. It's basically nothing flagging up and just a lot of background noise. And then here is a slightly more complicated case. We have a negative and this number of the duplicated reads compared with the number of enriched or copied reads they're virtually identical. And that's very, very symptomatic of having index misassignment or some other very low level of contamination. These are not real positives, they're negative in the lab for the pathogen. And so using that laboratory information, we were able to work out how to identify these and how to exclude them. And that was the cleaning step that I referred to earlier. Um, this is just demonstrating that after the cleaning step, um, which essentially, is just taking the difference between the blue and the yellow lines. It's not very complicated. Um, but after the cleaning step, we essentially have no enterovirus in the sample, which is great because that's what it should be. It should be negative for enterovirus. You can also look at co-infections. And this is really where the power of looking at the metagenomic panel comes in because it's quite possible for a single patient sample to contain more than one pathogen. This is more common in some illnesses than others. There's also no guarantee that both pathogens are causative, but if there is evidence that both pathogens can be causative, they will both be in a panel and we will have cases like this where a potential co-infection flags up. This is a very, very nice, clear case of a co-infection. It doesn't mean both pathogens are positive. In fact, it's almost certain that enterovirus B was the cause of the infection and not HHV6. And HHV6 may have been a sort of bystander, but nonetheless, both of those can be causative. And so both of them are in a panel and both of them are enriched. And not only are they enriched, they're effectively both sequenced. We looked at the samples that were called the clinical unknowns. So these were pathogens where there was no prior microbiology diagnosis in either cohort. Um, in about 34% of um, these samples, again, in both co cohorts, we were able to detect a relevant pathogen. And some of these samples have been um, through quite a few tests. So we were looking, we were working with depleted sample, a near depleted sample that has been through multiple freeze thaw um, cycles, and in some cases hadn't been treated all that nicely, and other cases had been treated quite well. So there was a bit of a range. Um, on the lab positives where we did have a diagnosis, we had a 99% sensitivity. Specificity is harder to calculate because when Castanet does find something in the lab negative and it's quite a strong positive, um, you'd have to, cal to calculate this, you'd have to assume that these are kind of false positives, but they may not be. Um, that you'd have to assume that the lab is right and there were actually negatives and ours or false positives. But with that aside, it's still a very high specificity and it may in fact be much higher if Castanet and not lab is right. Um, importantly, we actually did um, quite a bit of replication and we found that the results were completely reproducible. So the replicate sequences were identical. And by that, I mean that the pathogen was detected and that way we had sequence, the sequ there were no sequence differences. So the sequences were completely identical. Um, that means that Castanet 
similarly to vSeq is also a sequencing method. And just as an example, we could pull out enterovirus A and B genomes from the UK Chimes cohort. I've plotted them on a tree here and you can see the red ones are the ones that the lab didn't detect. Um, sometimes they detected a different pathogen in the same sample and some of them are actually co-infections with pneumococcus, um, but they are there. And then the green ones are the ones that the lab did detect. And the yellow ones are where there's a cluster of samples and the lab detected some, but not all of those. And we were able to find the others that look like they were quite possibly a transmission uh, cluster. So with that in mind, we added 30 um, additional intravirus positives to what was diagnosed by routine microbiology. They all had quite high quality sequences of those. Um, interestingly, 14 of these patients had actually never been tested for intravirus because, because of the sequential testing, if something else had been found first, or if there was some suggestion that the patient um, was responding to uh, treatment or there was something else going on, they potentially never made it to the lab to be tested. 16 of them were, however, tested uh, with 15 different protocols, it turned out. So I can't give you a complete kind of breakdown by protocol, but it was very interesting that um, there were lots of different labs and there were lots of different types of enterovirus that were either being found or not found. So it wasn't as simple as some primers that were not working in some of the labs. This is a more systematic situation. And of the 47 PCR positives that the laboratories detected, we detected 46. Um, and one may have been a sample from a different time point. It's not very clear. So again, we have pretty good accuracy overall and we're pretty happy with that. Um, if you think about Castanet as being the gold standard and compare the lab to that, then the lab actually only has 73% sensitivity. It's not a measure of any one particular lab. This is just in our cohort with the routine microbiology that was applied to those samples. However, when the lab does using the routine microbiology methods, when they call something positive, they generally, we generally agree with them. So in summary, Castanet's a flexible methodology for simultaneous detection and sequencing of pathogen genomes. It performs really well in clinical samples, even leftover CSF where there's minimal volume. Um, and I guess this is important as well that I didn't really have time to go into this. It also works based on antibiotic exposure, which culture, for example, doesn't. Um, we can get complete genomes for multiple viruses from a single sample, for example, that co-infection I just discussed. As an aside, we also have used it successfully for the rescue study to sequence over 400 RSV samples to do um, phylogeography of RSV with Professor Andrew Pollard. And in, in an absolutely amazing, I think, turn, it turns out that we can actually do differential expression profiling from the same data. And we've just published this in JID. And we're actually now using a very similar method for SARS-CoV-2. We've got specific probes for SARS-CoV-2, so we have been sequencing it using its specific probes, but we also have some Castanet data and we're looking at updating the panel to include it. And at the moment, the nearest thing we have in the panel is SARS-CoV-CoV. Uh, with that, I just want to end. Thank you to lots and lots of people, um, I guess particularly to Rory for kickstarting the project and to Cindy and Azim for seeing it through with me. Um, and yeah, and thank you very much to everybody involved.